Welcome to the Thriving Musician Podcast, where you go backstage with certified financial planner Spencer List to hear stories of how musicians make sound financial decisions on the path to artistic freedom and insights from industry professionals on how to level up your finances, career, and art. Here's your host, Spencer List. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Thriving Musician Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest in Lindy Vanestis. She is a financial planner. She owns her own business. It's called Create Financial Planning. So we're very similar. She works with creatives. I can't wait for you to get to know her and understand what she does. Um, And we were just talking about how people don't really know what a financial advisor or financial planner means. Like, What do those words actually mean? So she also, you know, uses words like behavior coach, mentor, handholder, um, and other words. So we're going to get into that. Um, but welcome, Lindy. Thank you, Spencer. So excited to be here. Yes. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you. I, when I first started my knowledge and learning journey in financial literacy for myself and teaching musicians, I never really had anyone else or knew anyone else who was doing this, but I also knew that I can't be the only person on the planet that's a creative that's interested in these things, wants to learn them, wants to help other people with them. And that's what led me to become a CFP, a certified financial planner, is I found a conference that said you had to be a CFP to attend, and that's where I was going to go learn a lot of this material from other professionals And so it's taken many years, but I'm so happy to know you. And I've met some other people, too, that may or may not be future guests, um, (laughs) because I want to share that there are other people out here doing this great work, helping creatives so that they can share more art with the world. Can you tell us a little bit more about your story and what brought you to doing this work? Thank you, Spencer. If we go into the way back machine, I used to be a personal trainer right after college. I had a double major in kinesiology, which is the study of human movement and biomechanics and nutrition and 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 psychology. And I felt amazingly successful when I helped my clients meet their goals. So we always started with where are you? What hurts? What are your goals? And the baby steps of how to get from here to there. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm in financial planning, I still feel like a personal trainer. It's the same process. Where are you? What hurts? What are your goals? And how do we take those baby steps to get here and there? But that's a huge leap from personal trainer flexing glutes to financial planner like flexing pocketbooks, right? (laughs) So I loved that career so much, but it didn't offer me a lot of freedom, both with time or financial freedom, because Mm -hmm. when are gyms open? 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. And I wasn't finding what I needed there from a growth perspective. So I ended up doing the thing that I said I would never do. And I got a job with at a desk. And I had 10 years at your local neighborhood property and casualty agency. And it was so busy. And we had 6,000 households that we serviced. And I started to feel Like I was missing that personal touch of getting to know people. So I thought, well, how can I feel more like a personal trainer and have that relationship and help people understand? So I then learned more about financial planning and decided I wouldn't have to throw away all of that knowledge I had about insurance, but it could be an added benefit. And then I went to a company where I thought I was doing planning, but I had to sell a certain amount of life insurance to keep my name on my business card. And then I went to a company where I thought I was doing planning, but they really discouraged me from working with people who didn't already have a million dollars. And 
my question is, how do you get a million dollars if nobody's going to give you advice? Right. And then I worked for a company where I helped with employee benefits, retirement planning. And, and then I had seen the industry and what I liked about it and what I didn't like about it. And that's where I decided to try to create more equity and help people where they are. And that's when create financial planning was born about in three years ago in 2020. So I'm so happy to be sitting here. I so honored to work with the people I do. I love it so much. It's just a treat. <laughs> Thanks. And what led you to working with creative specifically? Yeah, well, I dabble in making things. I've with some friends, something you will never see, made some music videos with we call ourselves the Game Night Rockers because it started out as Game Night. And so GNR for short. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that name, but and uh I also like to paint and photography and make jewelry and cards, but it's nothing that I'd ever considered making a career at. I don't really have any talent when it comes to that. <laughs> but I love the people do and they can make the world so much more beautiful and they're sharing their truth and by putting your energy as an artist out there and making the world beautiful and not having to worry about financial insecurity like what you shared on your website about what happened after a trip and you saw your bank statement and thought, oh, I don't ever want to feel this way again or have anybody else feel this way again. That is what I want to help people weather the ebbs and flows, how much it costs to make an album, how to do that without just diving into credit card debt. Mm -hmm. Right. So I chose to work with creatives of all types, whether it's you're making pottery or metal sculpture or albums or writing or acting. I just want people to feel the freedom to express their art and not have the stress of money. Yeah, that's wonderful. Are there any common themes you see among creatives when they come and talk to you asking for help or the language they use or mindsets, anything like that? A lot of variable cash flow mm -hmm. is one thing. It seems like when you're working, there's regular flow. And then there's sometimes things are seasonal. You might do a lot of holiday concert touring where mm -hmm. you have big expenses plus a lot of income. And so I see that. And wanting to understand how to pay for everything and save for the next thing, while also trying to think about saving for your future self, too. I often use myself as an example, just because I, I think about how am I going to provide for the little old lady Lindy someday? and. And, and I, I, I can see her and she has a really awesome life and she's healthy and she's active. And as, as a, as an artist, you probably never want to retire, but you want to have the ability to work when you want to and have the lifestyle that you want and live where you want and be responsible for the choices in your life. And if something happens that's out of your control, like a memory impairment, you still want to have the control of those decisions, even when you're beyond making the decisions. And so I try to help people not just live in the moment, but I say plan for the best, but prepare for the worst mm -hmm. type of situation. So we're always thinking about how do we care for ourselves today and in the future? 
And it's it's not fun, but I also think about where are we going to be from a tax standpoint someday. Spencer, when you passed your CFP exam, did you get your crystal ball? <laughs> how long were people going to live and how healthy were they going to be and what were taxes going to be when they were 90? <laughs> I didn't, mine didn't, I think they were out that day when I yeah. passed mine. So I don't have that magic eight ball shaker up and say, will taxes be lower when I'm in retirement? S- chances are yes. I, I don't. I don't know. I can't predict that. So I try to set people up in the way that I know that they're going to someday go, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that somebody helped me think about this Mm -hmm. back when. Mm -hmm. I am curious, in my experience, and I was like this as well, when I was fully focused on artistry or music or whatever, you know, for listeners, whatever it is that you do creatively, that was my focus 100%. And there is a lot of conventional wisdom out there. We I hear this sentence all the time. Musicians need to treat their art like a business. Okay, that's fine. So then we have people who are doing their artistry. Okay, now they've moved on to treating it like a business or whatever. They're generating income. But then we're getting further and further away from like the creative aspect. And as we're talking about planning, we're talking about cash flow, taxes, insurance, you know, what your future is going to be like. What's your experience with creatives and their mindset around thinking outside of like their just creativity right now and my art, I'm focused on this. When we, you and I both know we need to be thinking outside of that to prepare for these things and set ourselves up for success and our families and things like that. What, what are your thoughts there? The thing that I see the most overwhelmingly that also makes me very happy is this mindset of, I have other people that I care about, Mm. that I also want to really provide for them. So even if things are feeling really tight. I have clients who are wanting to care for their parents and helping make their parents' lives better and really understanding the value of family and and then starting their own families as well and making sure that they can provide in a comfortable way for what's coming next. And who knows, maybe if you do create more human beings or raise them, they will become YouTube stars by the time that they're seven and they won't need your assistance. They'll, but just in case, (laughs) right? And we know our parents, their paths are sort of set in stone and where to meet them where they are and help make their lives more comfortable. Mm And sometimes there's a dire need for that, where whether it be with mental health or lack of understanding or whatever. So the 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 thing that I see a lot is this real heart for family and compassion and wanting to to help others so much. And it's hard because as you know, there is variable cash flow. So how do you create this regular extra expense to say, I am going to give this much to my mom every month or whatever. That's a real burden of the heart and the finances both. Mm -hmm. And it adds stress too, to your need to produce create something and create that cash flow. But pretty consistently I do see people wanting to give back and provide for their families. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When we talk about financial literacy, I asked you before the show why is that important to you? And I loved your answer, so I'm going to read it and I'd love to hear your expanded thoughts. You said even though great art can come from a place of great pain and suffering, Everyone should be able to follow what makes them happy and elevates the world and be able to be self-actualized 
and enjoy the comforts of knowing they can provide for themselves and help others. I think that's wonderful. Care, would you care to expand on that? Mic drop. No. <laughs> <laughs> I I really do think that art makes the world so much a, a more fulfilling and beautiful place. And I maybe don't have the gifts to create a, a beautiful song or uh, something that you're going to see in MoMA, a beautiful piece <laughs> of art. But imagine if people didn't put themselves out there and pursue that, how bleak <laughs> our world would be. Mm -hmm. And I do think that some of the most touching poetry and songs come from heartbreak and life experiences, et cetera. So and that's how we heal, too, is by washing our souls with creating this piece that will help expel it from ourselves and and help other makes us relatable and help cure other people from their pain as well. And if we can do that in a way where we're safe and it's not that I have to just go do some work that soul sucks and takes all of my energy away from my time and my my physical so that I mean I've had to work other jobs while I've been while I built when I was first starting my own company I think we have to do what we have to do to make ends meet but once we're in that spot I want us to all be able to just focus on the thing that brings us the greatest joy mm -hmm. so that we can help other people because art is therapy for all of us in some way or another mm -hmm. we I talk about pain and suffering in the way that for musicians that can be fuel right for our music and for a lot of artists money can be a great source of pain and suffering and creating music about it can be healing so I'm curious your thoughts on where I'm thinking of people who are wanting to break through and, you know, heal that pain with someone helping them. And let's say they work with a planner and they've done all this great work and now money is no longer a pain for them. Um, for the artists who write songs about money, you know, maybe the money muse will go away. <laughs> so. Yeah, <laughs> not uh, recommending that you stay in suffering with your money. But for others, you know, there's still other pain and suffering that we would create art about. And I don't know where I'm going with this. It was just a thought that I had when you're talking about pain and suffering is that musicians may or may not want to sit there in that that's the place where the art comes from. So yeah. to talk about or consider healing a pain such as money is that something that creatives might shy away from now that it depends on the person but do you have right. thoughts there uh i did meet a man from a another con not from the states who was a beautiful wood carver he made these incredible pieces of furniture and tables etc and he told me that he was mad at money it it just it was so frustrating to him and i i was i thought that was an amazing thing to say because i don't everybody want anybody to feel that way however i think if we heal our relationship with money there's still going to be other things in your life it won't you won't suffer as an artist because you're now not struggling with money mm -hmm. but uh, to say that also the financial planning process is not scary or intimidating as it maybe it sounds it like it is if you think of yourself sitting on the edge of a metal doctor's table in a paper skirt it's 
might have some of that feeling to you, but I want to promise you that it's fluffy robes and slippers and <laughs> we do need full disclosure in order to help somebody. You can't mm-hmm. six months into the relationship go, oh yeah, by the way, I do have $250,000 worth of student loan debt I forgot to mention. Mm-hmm. And this high interest credit card debt. And, oh, and <laughs> mm-hmm. I need to know what's happening. But the things that we're doing in the financial planning process are really designed to help you. And you can't ignore the pain and get better mm-hmm. if I want to stick with the doctor analogy. <laughs> so, it's it really is where are you and what hurts and i need to know what are you earning what are you ex- what are your expenses what is the project that you want to spend money on what what does that look like what are you hoping to earn from that how often do you if you're creating a new album are you going to do that every other year does it have three mu- music videos that go with it What's your expense? Are you doing radio promotion? Are you are you paying an agent to help? And what what is their cut? What is your rent or your mortgage? Do you have this goal to have a home? Do you rent recording studio space? Are you paying musicians as you travel or th- while you're recording? So all of the things like it sounds like a lot, but really the process is to make you safe Mm -hmm. to fully examine all of the things so we are and the other thing i'll say is a plan is just a snapshot in time Mm -hmm. it's only going to be right for about one second (laughs) (laughs) because the world is changing you're changing everything's Mm -hmm. changing but it we are constantly making assumptions, but they are very educated based on your real data or your real hopes and dreams and mm-hmm. where you are now, what you want to accomplish, real goals. And it's better to make those assumptions and be looking at it. And because there are things that, that Spencer, you and I know that mm-hmm we can help people with to help them make right choices about how to save, how to plan for future projects, what to look for later in life, how to set things up properly. Even if it's helping with setting up the, okay, I am not a CPA, nor am I an attorney, but I can help make referrals or say you need to contact this person i'm not an estate attorney but boy i sure want my people that i'm working with to think about if i do get sick or hurt and can't speak for myself who will do that for me Mm -hmm. so that it's again you're protecting your family from infighting about how to care for you etc so we are just covering all of the things adulting (laughs) yeah yeah, sorry to use that word, but it's just all of the things that we need to think about so that we create the least amount of harm by walking on this planet. And we really help the people who care about us cope with whatever's coming for us. Mm-hmm. And we can provide for them in all of the ways that we can provide for them. Yeah. Wow. Well said. And you're speaking my language. Maybe are we the same person? I'm not sure. So <laughs> I think it's crucial, though, and I I would love for you to share um, for for listeners or for anyone out there who's thinking, I think this is something I need to do. And that can be nerve wracking. Like you mentioned, it might feel like you're on the metal desk. It's cold. Um, <laughs> can we talk about what that planning process looks like? and you know, it's somewhat different for different people, but in the end, there is sort of a framework. And I think that would be really useful to share, you know, what your process is and what that looks like to work with a planner. Yeah, that's pretty easy. So 
I have been in the office where the advisor said, I need every piece of paper that you ever generated before in your life. That is not helpful. I don't really need all of that. I feel like the things that I need to help you build a big plan, you have either in your brain or probably on an app in your phone, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't ask people to do a lot of heavy lifting or preparing before the meeting. I want our time together to be really productive. I tell people that I help people get stuff done. That's part of, I help people do things that they might not normally do. So I have this process where the initial meeting is, and you have a process like this, to where you have a a flow, you have a specific things that you do in each meetings, Mm -hmm. in each meeting. And so mine, I will say is based on my business name. So the first meeting that I have with people is called the canvas meeting, because we are just blank canvases getting to know one another. It is a introductory gratis, you know, charge call where we just decide if it makes sense for us to work together or not. We're getting to know one another finding out what you're, what you're looking for, if we're a good fit or not, mm-hmm. et cetera. So then the second meeting usually runs about an hour and a half for me, where this, I would call the the metal desk, to, uh, it's the <laughs> realism where I start gathering all the information to build a financial plan. And I will go into that in a minute, what that looks like. Uh, The next meeting with me would be the expression meeting, about another 90-minute meeting again, where we, I share the plan, but my planning software probably gives about a 45-page report where (laughs) that is not helpful to people. In fact, I don't do one-time plans anymore because like I said a minute ago, I want to help people actually get stuff done. Mm -hmm. If I meet with somebody and do a one-time plan, I feel like I have to write them a Tolstoy novel because to do due diligence, I do have to talk about savings, taxes, insurance, estate planning, all of employee benefits, self-employee benefits, whatever, all of the things. And it's overwhelming. So the the software gives a big plan. I also give a one-page financial plan that says, this is why you contacted me. You wanted to really make sure that you understood cash flow, the best places to save, estate planning, planning for a home purchase, retirement, whatever that those goals were for you. Here are your to-do items. We are going to start putting $300 a month into your high interest savings account, right? So just like very specific steps. Then we'll mm-hmm. set short-term goals. By April of next year, so four months from now, we plan to have $1,200 more into this high yield savings account with our first goal being at least one month of emergency fund. And then our long-term goal is we will have three months of emergency fund by the end of the year in this account. So I'm like making the stepping stones for how to get to each goal by very specifically saying what to do, where to do it, how to do it. Then the follow-up meeting after that is the action meeting where I might, depending on the person or their goals, but do their comfort with investing risk. So do some questions about their personality, their comfort. Are they interested in sustainable investing? What does that look like? What's which direction are they tilting? Social, environmental. And then if they have investments already, making sure that they're in line with what their actual comfort is, because that's one thing I don't like about the industry is people not understanding what they're doing or why. Mm -hmm. So this is really giving each person control and an insight into what they're doing. 
Then we would have quarterly checkups and talk about what's going on in their lives. Another way that I'm really involved with people is understanding cash flow and setting goals. I do think it's important that people have the capacity to dream. And I have met some people who have absolutely no idea what they would want Mm -hmm. for their future. And it's hard to do a plan without knowing what you're looking for. And then I also do uh, an annual review of that plan. So I'll now go back to what is what makes up a financial plan. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and then, so in my planning software, it's I use this program called Right Capital, and it assumes that every person is going to live until 90 years old. Now, I don't want to assume that for you because maybe your grandparents are already centurions they're 100 and you might plan to live till 105 or 110 so i want to talk about that because and then we make assumptions too about well will social security still be in place when i'm around and so we can we can talk about your attitudes about those things Mm -hmm. and what we see coming down the road and if there is social security when would be the best time to draw and what would it look like if you went earlier or not? And and do you expect to have good health for your life or in the last couple of years of your life? I have a couple of family members who had Alzheimer's and were in assisted living memory care for eight years or longer. So do you want to plan for the norm of somebody needing a neighbor kid to come over and mow the lawn for a couple of years or the worst case scenario where you're and so we like I said every situation each person is different and individual so we want to plan for how long do you plan on living what's how healthy is that life what are your current expenses and as you maybe decide to work less or create less what do you want your expenses to be down the road and also if you're helping pay for somebody's education that inflation rate might be a little bit different than just normal inflation and same with healthcare so we need to talk about the different so this is stuff you really can't do on the back of a napkin right in addition to your expenses, how are you saving? Are you thinking about what that savings means from your own ability to control your income bracket in re- in your 70s and beyond? Will you owe taxes on what you've saved? So we are thinking about the different ways to save and as a self-employed person there's you have different options and something that might not necessarily be considered a retirement account maybe you could just in your mind's eye know that that is for retirement and but give you more access to it while you're working and creating before you hit that full retirement age etc too right what is your income? What are you projecting your income to be? Goals. This is huge. This is where I help people dream too. Are you wanting to do more education for yourself, for other family members? How's do you do you need a car? Do you plan on traveling a lot? Do you want to have a big wedding for yourself or your family members? Help with that. Do you want to buy property, have investment property, have some vacation, have a do an improvement on the place that you have already? Are you into gifting? There's there's special rules where you can make your money go a lot further if you're over 70 and you are gifting. Don't just write a check from your checking account. Not that anybody writes checks anymore, but you could have a lot more power 
by being smart about how you are charitable? And do you want to create some type of legacy and ongoing foundation? And then also collecting what you have saved and built already. Also, I do look at, now I, we didn't talk about this before, but you and I both are fee only financial advisors. So neither of us could get any commissions. I don't sell any insurance mm-hmm. at all, but I do talk about people's homeowners insurance. I mm-hmm. talk about their auto insurance. I talk about personal liability umbrella insurance. I help them talk about life insurance and long-term care insurance. And if they in long-term disability insurance. I talk about estate planning. Really important to understand what accounts have beneficiaries and what accounts don't have beneficiaries. The the healthcare directives and power of attorneys and wills, et cetera. So financial planning, it is an ongoing process. And so the goal really is that each one of those quarterly check-ins to pick a topic and it's an ongoing process and we really are accountability partners Mm -hmm. to help. Okay. So how did the meeting, did you find somebody that you would want feel comfortable raising your children? If you're not there someday, they might not necessarily be in charge of the money. Who would that be? You know, so we can save you a lot of money by helping you make these decisions before you go speak with an attorney And we can save your family a lot of heartbreak and infighting by you having made these decisions as well. And very clearly communicating exactly what it is, what you want, Mm -hmm. what you are looking for. So it's a big ongoing process and your goals in your life and the world is always changing. And so it's important that we just keep, that you stay in touch with your advisor. and, And when something happens, a big influx of money, an inheritance, a new deal, a new car, a house, whatever, that you are working with your advisor and talking to them and and getting their feedback on what they see. I I can't believe how many people, t- I'm, I have some clients right now who are wanting to do um, in vitro and they, we are saving them so much money because we're planning on funding it from their health savings account. So basically, all of the money that they would have paid on that deductible, they're not having to pay income tax on it first. Mm-hmm. So that's saving them at least 20% on this procedure. So working with an advisor can really help even with your family planning. <laughs> so... So there are so many things in financial planning and it can feel overwhelming to hear all these things. Like I haven't even thought about disability insurance and, you know, estate planning and all these things. So it can, you know, from metal table to look at, all, like, let's talk about all these things in your life that we want to plan for. That can be overwhelming. But like you said, that's something that you, you tackle one thing at a time. It's a process. You work through it. That's why... Sometimes a one-time plan doesn't make sense because your life is not a one-time event that <laughs> just happens right now and then it's over. Can you tell me, in your opinion, when does it make sense for an artist or creative to start working with a planner on all these things? 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Best time to plant a tree, right? 20 years ago. No, right away. I want people to start as soon as they start making any money at all. I, one of my best girlfriends, her daughter just graduated from high school and my gift to her was a financial plan. Mm -hmm. She's just starting college, working little jobs. And I want her to be armed with information right away so she can start making good choices. People who save a little bit every month and start young will have such a more comfortable situation down the road than people who wait even 10 years Mm -hmm. start i mean where you are right now start right now (laughs) yeah i agree and so if people are thinking yeah i 
I wish I had done this sooner, but I, I want to start now. Let's talk about the cost because, and if you're willing to share some of the other methods that planners charge, but also I'd love to hear what does it look like to work with you? And because I'm sure that's a thing that's on people's mind is this sounds amazing. I need this. I want this. I need help. Uh, but then there's this barrier of price. And of course, we all have different money mindsets and, you know, why things are worth what they are. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I am a self-employed person too. So I do have some autonomy and the ability to do things as seen is to help people, especially a creative. So I I have posted pricing on my website, but I also do have the ability to negotiate and help so that it's not a barrier to entry. If, mm -hmm. But my posted pricing is I charge an upfront financial planning fee and it's different if it's for one person versus a multi-member household versus if it's a planning for a business. And for a, an individual, I charge $2,400 up front. And for a couple, I charge $3,250 up front. And then f there's an ongoing subscription. So you, the reason I charge for the upfront financial plan is it's, you and I might be spending an hour and a half together as I gather the information for your plan and then as I show you your plan, but I might be spending eight to 10 hours of my own time on the backside mm -hmm. preparing that, doing due diligence. And plus there's a lot of experience. I've been in this industry since 2002. So mm -hmm. you're paying for that as well. Mm -hmm. So time and experience. Plus I have a lot of tools, the software and other things that mm -hmm. help make it um, as accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So there's all of that. And then, so ongoing monthly subscription for an individual, it starts at $375 a month. I do have the ability to help clients manage investments if they want. About half of my clients do manage money with me and the other are just simply planning. And I do charge a, an assets under management fee for that. So if somebody has money already that they want me to help and be their advisor of record, I will shave off some of that monthly subscription pricing or waive it altogether, depending on how much money they want me to help them invest. So uh, that's another way that I can help create a little bit less of a budget monthly situation for planning. Mm -hmm. Like a cat from a cash flow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But I I know that um sometimes like for example you have a program when you do pro bono mm -hmm. there are other advisors who I've done it in the past and so in certain circumstances that's an option as well. And sometimes I will negotiate the pricing as well, but that's my mm -hmm. my posted price right there. Yeah, that makes sense. And so two questions. What's your experience with, you know, I'm imagining a listener or anybody who's reaching out to a planner, they're creative, they're thinking about the price. I've heard a lot of different things about what do I get in return? People are thinking there's like a monetary value that comes back to them that's higher than the price, which sometimes that's the case. I've looked at a tax return in five seconds and saved someone far more than the price. But that's not really why we're doing what we do. It's not necessarily just the monetary value, although you could argue over a lifetime, the monetary value of making good financial decisions is monumental. Oh. It's, uh, yeah. And so I'm curious your thoughts and experience on, for people who are just trying to mentally justify this, they understand the, they see the value, but then they see the price. Do you have thoughts on that? Right. Well. 
<laughs> it's hard when you're young, <laughs> 20 or 30 to, or even forties or even in your fifties, honestly, to think about what am I going to pay for Medicare or what am I tax bracket going to be in retirement? And I think a lot of people assume that they're going to be in a lower tax bracket in retirement than they are when they're working today. I have had clients say to me, I didn't realize that Medicare could cost such vastly different amounts every month. So let's say you have been a very good saver. So you were in the music industry for several years Mm -hmm. and let, I don't know what you made, but let's say you were killing it and you just like max funded your retirement account and you saved, you took all these tax write-offs and you saved, pushed away so much money into a retirement account to get the tax write-off that year when you made all that money. Someday, Mr. IRS person is going to come up and say, oh, I'm so glad you were so successful. Now we are coming for your income taxes. If you save in that way, you might not be in control of what your income is in your 70s and 80s and beyond because Mm -hmm. there's a requirement of how much you have to take out of a percentage of that account. And it might actually be more because it's had all those years to grow. It might actually be more money than what you're making today. And we don't know what the tax rates will be in the future. So I have done a side-by-side comparison of if I save this way versus if I save this way, how much will I pay in taxes over my lifetime? And it's, you can save hundreds of thousands of dollars by just saving in a tax savvy way. Mm -hmm. And that's assuming taxes are the same as they are today. But we can't assume, because if you look at a chart of tax history, it has been, we are historically at one of the lowest tax brackets today. It's been up in the 90s as the highest tax rate in the past. And with student loan debt, the national debt, COVID, Social Security, I am not going to tell my clients to assume that they're going to be in a lower tax bracket in retirement. So there's that. Plus, by having that money that you have to take out of those retirement accounts, that is considered earned income or, and that affects that's income taxable and that affects what you pay for Medicare every month. And you could pay a hundred and some dollars or you could pay over 400 for the exact same health insurance. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I can monetize what I do for my clients by helping them save millions of dollars. (laughs) in there and then by making good choices about when to take social security i mean that's where if they live a long life that can help too and also dumb things like i had a client who not so i only meet with people on zoom and i so most of my clients are scattered throughout the country throughout the u.s but i happen to have a local client who called me one day in a panic because a circuit went out in the kitchen and he had an electrician in who told him he had to rewire his whole house. And I said, here's our electrician, (laughs) give him a call. And he was able to put in a new fuse box and fix the circuit for a couple hundred dollars versus 20,000. So I, it would have been a life changing thing for him to not have called me. And since then, he's now been able to move out of a neighborhood where he didn't feel necessarily comfortable because it was affected a lot by the George Floyd rioting and there was a lot of violence. And now they've moved actually from Minnesota to Wisconsin to be closer to family. So they now have built in grandparent daycare too. So not having to pay that massive Bill helped them 
move on to their next goal more quickly. So yes, I can quantify the value of working with an advisor. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But then there's the non-quantifiable, right? The feeling of knowing that you can, you're working towards or already achieved whatever, you know, I call it artistic freedom, whatever that is for you. It's hard to quantify that feeling, right? And we say peace of mind all the time. And it's it's difficult because we're saying we're contemplating whether to pay someone a quantifiable amount of money to help me mm-hmm. achieve a feeling that I can't quantify. And really, there's no value to that, right? It's infinite. And so it's like paying for Hulu. You're getting a feeling by engaging in the storytelling and that, but this is you helping to write your own story. Well said. Um, I want to ask you one last thing about working with a planner and what it costs. Can you describe um, other methods that people charge so that people out there who are looking, they're kind of aware of what it looks like um, and what to what questions to ask and what to be looking for when they're looking to work with somebody. Yeah. Financial planning, I'd say historically has been more investment advising and not planning. So a straight up investment advisor who may or may not be a CFP certified financial planner usually will charge you a percent of assets under management. So they will manage your money. Sometimes they want all of it. Sometimes they have account minimums. In addition to charging either an an asset under management fee of, I'd say 1% of what you have is pretty standard. Sometimes they're, they're more than that, a lot more. So make sure you understand. Also, sometimes there are, let's say in your account where your investments are, you own companies, stocks or bonds. There's a charge sometimes to buy those or sell those. And so make sure that, and the, your broker or uh, advisor, investment professional, make sure you understand what they are getting paid. What those so that's one way the very traditional that's where the industry came from, I would say. Another type of person who is seen as you or uses the financial advisor label is an insurance broker or representative, and they can sell insurance, life, disability, annuities long-term care. And sometimes those products are appropriate and necessary and, but, and it's important to to right size them and make sure you understand what it is, what it, what it actually is. Is it right for you and how much they're getting paid also? And there's things that are sold in a way that make it sound like it's something else. And just making sure you understand how does it fit into your long-term goals and what is the actual cost to you and what is the commitment and how long is it is the commitment ongoing. So that's another way is a commission for the sale of a mm-hmm. product or I guess a contract. Mm-hmm. And then what's becoming more of the trend in the industry now is the subscription based of planning where you would just like a gym membership, you have this ongoing relationship with an advisor and you may not see them every month, but often you pay a monthly subscription or you can do quarterly or semi-annually. And then there's also the one-time planning fee. Some, some advisors still do a a one-time plan. I'm not interested in doing that anymore because I want the ongoing relationship. I want to make sure that people are actually accomplishing the things in the plan and I want to help them 
be their accountability mentor for that situation. Mm-hmm. Are there other things that you're seeing as how people are charging that I I guess the only other one I would add is I've seen, and I technically this is what I do right now is advice only, where I don't manage assets. I could if I chose to. So I don't see the, the difference is just there that your planner is doing the investments for you versus just show you know giving you advice saying here's how to do it yourself. Yeah. Um yeah, that's the only other thing that I'm seeing. And I think mainly the the main point that we're sharing on this is like look at how people are incentivized to work with you where and I'm sure we're biased, but the you know fee only meaning we don't make commissions, we don't sell products like you pay what we say you pay, there's no hidden fees. Um, you know, it's all transparent. It's there, you know what it costs. And there's this other world where you don't know what it, what it costs. I've talked to a lot of people and I say, what are you, what are you paying them? And they say, I don't know. Yeah. It's like, wait, you signed up for a service and you don't know what it costs. Um, so I think that's really important to know. And there are advisors who are incentivized to push certain products they're bound by the company they work for and you know yeah. leaving my opinion out of it is that something that you're interested in it's just the awareness right. of knowing who you're working with what are their incentives or is it just you know in our case if we're fiduciaries and we don't sell products don't make commissions we have no incentive to give advice that's not in your best interest. Our incentive is just to help you. It's always in your best interest. That's it. There is yeah. nothing else. You're just, that's what you pay for. Um, so I think that's really important for people who are looking for help to make sure they understand what that relationship looks like. Asking questions. Don't be afraid to ask because if you don't ask, they won't tell you. And if you do I mean, ask and you don't get a straight answer and you don't feel comfortable then you did the right thing and you know, okay, I need to keep looking. Yeah. I'm glad you threw out the word fiduciary because so that basically just means like we, we only do what's right for our clients. It's their need is the most important. It's not what's best for us as the advisor, Mm -hmm. but, but actually it is what's best for my client is what's best for me. But I know companies that have funds that I'm trying to say this carefully that they will win award trips if they sell a certain amount of that fund for that company and they have two massive award trips for their employees every year so they I don't think are operating under a fiduciary standard by saying, Mm -hmm. yeah, my clients definitely should be in this fund so that I can go to Fiji Mm -hmm. (laughs) in March. (laughs) Right. And so that's important too, for you to understand what is the advisor's motive. Is it the lowest cost, best performing, or is it, are they going on an amazing five-star vacation funded by their company later this year. (laughs) And a fiduciary is required to disclose that conflict of interest. So Mm -hmm. I guess it it would be okay if they said, hey, I recommend this for you. I think it's a good option for you, but also I am (laughs) going to get, I'm going to go to Fiji because of it too. Are you cool with that? And you say yes, then I guess that's fine. Right. Um, Yes. And uh, I want a (laughs) (laughs) t-shirt. Okay, so you told me a crazy but true fact about you that we need to discuss, and um, you don't like donuts. That's true. (laughs) Has that been since from the womb? You know, did something happen? I remember going to friends' birthday parties in grade school, slumber parties, and the only thing they would have for breakfast in the morning was a box of donuts. And I was completely disgusted by the smell and I will not eat them. Interesting. <laughs> is um, 
did you just not eat? You just. Right. Yeah. yeah. Is it sugar? Is it something in them? Allergic <laughs> allergies? Anything? I have no idea. I I am the product of uh, divorced parents. And for some reason, so maybe it's maybe it's psychological trauma, but my dad, when he. I'm originally from Montana. My dad would bring me to the airport the morning of the day I was coming back home. And he would take me to Mr. Donut or whatever. And we would drive in there. And I just remember the smell. Mm. (laughs) I'm making a face, even though it's a podcast, not a good face. (laughs) And I remember the smell and being in front of this case of all of these things. And I've heard this is where I went wrong, but I would pick like the driest cake donut because everything else looked it doesn't look like real chocolate it's yeah. like waxy and plastic it, it almost looks like lego like plastic food it just doesn't look real and i i would sit there and just pick at it and not want to eat it and so yeah i never have liked donuts ever i don't let them in my house like <laughs> sorry partner that cannot be in my car or my house i just can't (laughs) so if you want to keep lindy away just put a put a wreath of donuts on your door like garlic (laughs) yeah but if you had a wreath of garlic i would be there in a heartbeat there Uh, we go (laughs) so you're not a vampire that's good (laughs) love garlic so yeah my mine if i had to live off of two foods it would be hummus and guacamole (laughs) oh nice (laughs) so wonderful well thank you so much lindy is there if if there was one piece of advice you would give to listeners what might that be do it like take care of yourself so put your don't don't be afraid of being judged. We are professionals. We are not here to judge you. We have hearts for this. We have seen everything and we just take care of yourself and do this thing. It is it is nothing that you can't get through with the help of somebody else. Mm-hmm. yeah how can listeners learn more about you and or get in touch with you my website is create fp for create financial planning and my there's the link to my calendar at create fp as well as my email but my name is lindy l-i-n-d-y and my email is lindy at create fp.com and I do have a cash flow worksheet that I use in a lot of my planning. And if somebody emails me and says they want a copy of that, I would gladly do an introductory Zoom with them and just show them the tabs and how to use it and give it to them for free without them even being a client. Client, Because I think it is that important to understand that you money is not all or nothing that you can save and meet your goals and invest and live your life at all at the same time wonderful that is fantastic please take lindy up on that i'll put all that in the show notes um i thank you so much lindy i hope that you found this helpful and not overwhelming and If you know of another thriving musician who would benefit from listening to this, please share this with them or better yet, leave a review on iTunes. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Keep thriving. Want more ideas, tools, and resources on how to achieve artistic freedom? Read the leading financial blog for musicians at moneymaestroblog.com and sign up for the Financial Literacy Newsletter. Want to submit questions or nominate a thriving musician for a future episode? Fill out the contact form on moneymaestroblog.com and keep thriving.